Hi, what's up? Welcome to the stream. Today we have an amazing show for you. We're going to be getting into some really interesting global issues and surrounding a particular uh, group of people, or I should say a particular amalgamation of individuals who do some really fascinating things online. Before we do that, we want to start with our normal conversation about the issues of the day. We will be continuing after the television broadcast right here on stream.aljazeera.com, a conversation about the various topics that we brought up, so stay tuned. Ahmed, Nora, great to see you guys today. Everything is buzzing about this speech that Obama gave uh, on the Middle East. What do you think? Well, there were a lot of direct um, things that he said to leaders of the country, um, a lot of calls for action in terms of rights, and I really liked how he pointed out women's rights and how he um, addressed that he has to do, we have to do more in terms of economics, mm -hmm. supporting entrepreneurs, technology, inf access to information. So that were my favorite parts of the speech. Interesting. How about you? I mean, you know, I think he spoke, you know, I mean, I think he spoke in broad overtones. I think tone. just the head nod was the, broad, that, that no, was the skeptical head direct. tilt. Well, you either follow this or you have to well, leave. I mean, I just don't think he really illuminated any nuances about what's going on on the region, on the ground. And he spoke kind of in broad strokes. I think he said a lot of the right things. A lot of people are really happy with regards to the Palestinian-Israeli issue that he spoke about the 1967 borders mm -hmm. yeah. and, you know, kind of made that, uh, you know, going into, what is it, Sunday speech at yeah. APAC? Yeah. Sunday speech Setting that up. But, I mean, and, I will And for those that yeah. don't know, APAC is the American-Israel Israeli, right. Political Action Committee. It's yeah. the most powerful Israeli lobby in the United yeah, States. Yeah, it's referred to as the Jewish lobby, I mean, yeah. you know, by most people, or by many people, I should say. I, I will say that I was disappointed that one theme that I think has dominated the news um, in the Arab world and throughout these uprisings that he didn't bring up, which is the non-violent protest. Mm -hmm. uh, he spoke about people, you know, vo voicing the rights and he referenced Wa'al Ghanim by talking about a Google exec yeah. and it's no surprise. I just feel like, you know, we've seen non-violent protests in Palestine, we've seen them in Egypt, in Tunisia, mm -hmm. in Syria, and so I just wish well, he would have... I think he yeah. did kind of reference, he, he did he a did. couple of things. He referenced it in the context of, look at what's happened when the people stood up for their own rights vis-a-vis -vis what Al-Qaeda has been talking about. Right, right. He was going on about the death of Bin Laden, but that yeah. the Arab Spring was but something To me that different. was irrelevant. Oh, oh, absolutely, but that was his way of connecting it. Also, he connected the idea of the, two interesting things I thought, he connected the the uh, U.S. Mm -hmm. uh, American Revolution, which was a violent revolution, right. and the civil rights movement in the United States, mm -hmm. which was largely nonviolent, you're right. To this whole quest right. for freedom in the Middle East, so right. that was intriguing. But th you're right; it, it led some people loved it, some people mm -hmm. uh, were not so excited about it. Um, something that was interesting when you said that, yeah, some people were kind of like. You know, we just got a press release from the Simon Wiesenthal Center, uh, which is a prominent pro-Israeli uh, right. NGO here in the United States, and they did not like it at all. They supported what he said about the Arab Spring, but they didn't like this idea of moving back to the pre-1967 borders. Mm -hmm. And people are saying, well, that's been sort of a tacit... Uh, understanding, but I, I feel like this was a very strong, explicit statement by an American president. I don't know if we've seen that before. Yeah, I mean, you could say that. A lot of people will come on either side of the fence. <laughs> exactly. I mean, you know, we were having that discussion upstairs with some of the rest of the team. Yeah. Um, I, I mean, you know, I, I think one thing, and obviously everyone comes to this from their perspective of what they want him to talk about, yeah. but one thing that I think he, he didn't necessarily do is, he and where he was consistent with, like, past administrations, is he kind of, you know, didn't stray far Far from the narrative, specifically with the Arab-Israeli or, or Palestinian-Israeli conflict, you know, he yeah. didn't stray too far from the, the normal narrative, except with the 1967 thing, in the sense that he said, you know, Israel, he emphasized Israel's right to uh, defend itself, and he said every state has the right to self-defense. I tweeted this out, um, but you know, does that not include the Palestinians or Bahrain? And I, you know, I think he uh, spoke about Bahrain. Palestinians are not a state yet. So exactly. as long but, as they're not a state, they don't I mean. have like, that right. You only have the right if you're a state because yeah, you're not it's recognized. Very, it's, you know. it's, it's like Diplo speak. Hold on one second. Let's see if our Skype guest is ready. Skype, can you hear us? Hi, Gabrielle. How are you? Good. How are you? Very well, thank you. We so much appreciate you taking the time to join us. Sure, my pleasure. We're going to be coming to you in just a bit at the top of the show. Sounds great. Okay, wonderful. So, I mean, Nora, what do you think? I mean, it seems like this is the kind of speech where you're damned if you do, you're damned if you don't. You, there's no way to make everybody happy. Yeah, it's not. But I, I think that, I mean, he took a new stand, and that's going back to, yeah. the, to, to the 67 border. Mm -hmm. So I, th I think that's quite brave to say that. Mm -hmm. And, I mean, so I, 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 
and also calling out the leaders of the different countries, like I yeah. said earlier. Yeah. I and mean, that was uh, like directly. There was. And he brought up Bahrain, which yes. I don't but, think people were expecting but, him to. But this is what I mean about like, he brought up Bahrain, but yeah. he didn't mention the Saudis or Saudi Arabia's role in the crackdown on but, protesters. But okay, so this is what I was saying online because I was tweeting with someone. Uh, Jillian York was saying, well, he didn't bring up the Saudi yeah. role in Bahrain, but I'm like, yeah, but if he did, he you wouldn't be seeing walk to work protests in Uganda. You'd be seeing the United States. Yeah, because, because of the gas prices would go through. Well, that's, that's, so. so so the part of the thing is, right. you're talking about politicians, not people. Right. So when you've got all this stuff yeah. on, and course, you give a speech course. where you piss off the Israelis and the Saudis at the same time, yeah. that <laughs> takes at least political but, courage, even if the average person doesn't like it. But do you said it yourself, like skirting around the issues. Like yeah. that's what I mean about this not being a departure. And now obviously yeah. we can't expect him to, at such a tumultuous time, like you know, give the speech where he calls everything, you know, he calls a spade a spade. Yeah. But um, it would be refreshing to see a little bit more of that considering the fact that U.S. foreign policy has been proven to be pretty much, uh, I don't want to say irrelevant, but not extremely effective as we've seen by these revolutions. Well, I think that ultimately, like when you're looking at the political realm, change tends to happen incrementally. I mean, the only time you see revolutionary switches right. in policy is when you're having a revolution. Yeah. So as far as what could have happened, it was more than I expected. Yeah, no. Though I'd agree, I agree that we won't really know if it was anything meaningful until we see what he says at APAC on Sunday. Right. Is he going to hold his ground? Yeah, and, and there's also always a lot of things going on in, in the back. I mean, you can't just scare away people by sometimes being too direct. Yeah, no, you're, you, you exactly. raise, so. I mean, those are all valid points, especially I'm sure his speechwriter, if he in fact wrote this I himself. Know. You know, people were, you know, one of the hashtags was, why is he late? Like, yeah, why, why is Obama late? late? That was the minutes. best part. We were all over there like, why is Obama People are late? speculating. Although, I will say... He's on the phone with call, King Abdullah. Call me a conspiracy theorist, uh -huh. but, you know, he stumbled at one point in the speech. We, we, uh, we got to wrap it up. Okay. I want you to bring we'll that up that for the later. Break, though. Yeah. Uh, folks, we're going to go live. We'll see you on the air in just a sec. Hi, I'm Derek Ashong, and you are now in the stream, a social media community with its own daily TV show. We are bringing you the stories that are ongoing, global, and sourced from social media. Today, we take an in-depth look at internet activist Anonymous and why they're both revered and reviled for what they do. As always, our digital producer, Ahmed Shab El Din, is on the couch. Back with us for a second day is Nora Abu State. She is a member of the founding team behind the Digital Life Design Conference, which connects innovation, design, science, and social media leaders for inspiration. She's also the founder of Berta Style. Tell us, Nora, what is Berta Style? Yeah, Berta Style is an open source DIY fashion community. People use social networking tools to make their own clothes, something like this, what I'm wearing. So you can share sewing patterns. We made it. I was seamstress made. I could have. It's I beautiful, I will say. <laughs> yeah, so you share sewing patterns, okay. techniques, and then you show what you've made and get the recognition of well, the community. I, I love that maker culture is transcending yes. in so many different ways. And you guys are fusing technology and real world maker culture. Uh, what we're going to be talking about a little bit in a few minutes is actually very closely related, at least in the sense of open source communities. Right. Um, before we get into that though, Ahmed, we were talking about the Obama speech on the Middle East just in the pre-show. We're going to cover it a little in the post-show, but we asked people some of their thoughts on it. What kind of stuff did they say? Yeah, I mean, we asked people for their comments, their quick reactions to the speech. And we'll just start with one from Nick the Neighbor, who is quoting Obama. You know, he talked about the greatest talent and resource of the Middle East is its people, but then Nick adds what Obama didn't mention is, and it's oil. Now, we can't expect Obama to talk about oil so directly, but some people, a lot of people were talking about this. And just to throw one other tweet in there, and this was commonly tweeted, this subject, 
Green Alpha says, nothing about Saudi, and how hard is it to apologize for backing those dictators for years and years? So the idea is, you know, a lot of people wanted him to talk about Saudi, and even though he mentioned Bahrain, a mm -hmm. lot of people even here, he said, great speech, and Slayton saying it was wide-reaching, but surprised that he talked about Bahrain, but lots of people are also surprised he didn't talk about Saudi's role in cracking down the protests in Bahrain. Yeah, I, I mean, as a politician, we kind of mentioned that before, yeah. you can't just always say how it is. You have a certain interest, right. you know, and yep. we all know that uh, Saudi is not just a nice desert. Yep. And so there is something <laughs> down there that, you right. know, you need as a, yeah. as a state. And so, I mean, there were a few things that he said where he was calling on certain leaders yes. and was uh, was telling them, you know, it's time to step down uh, or to make certain well, concessions. Well, he made so. a couple of profound statements. Once he called for uh, negotiations between Palestinian and Israel to be right. made around the 1967 borders, right. which was a big deal for an American president to make an explicit statement that way. Mm -hmm. We've already seen a negative response from some pro-Israeli groups, and some Palestinian pro-Palestinian groups are saying he didn't say enough. Also, though, the thing that struck me that is most interesting in a way is his comments on the United States will support right. democratic movements in the Arab world, right. and they're going to be financially backing a democratic yes. Egypt. Yep. which provides some kind of incentive, maybe a shift in their policy, given how wishy-washy yeah. the State Department I mean, was earlier. I mean, you, yeah, you would certainly expect that there will be a shift in the policy, because clearly this speech and I think the uprisings themselves are yeah. a testament to the fact that the foreign policy of the U.S. has not necessarily been working. Yeah, well, and it's the people who've driven this shift in policy. Yeah, and yeah. We just, you spoke about women earlier, and you were happy that he spoke about women. I just want to get one tweet in there from Malak Jafar saying he gave a shout-out to women and freedom, but again failed to mention Saudi Arabia. Yes, and it's kind of interesting because in Saudi Arabia, things are happening. Mm -hmm. the, there's a woman now who drives. Yeah. I think you guys heard about that, yes, right? Yes, did. Yeah. So people are being inspired and they're acting upon it. And, yeah, well, and I, think, I, I think the Saudis are going to have to drive that change. America yeah. will not be driving change in Saudi or they won't be driving at all. <laughs> oil, 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 hint, hint. I mean, let's <laughs> talk a little bit about yeah, the Yeah, speaking topic. of which, we're, we're uh, you know, always encouraging you at home to be tweeting at us if you have sh stories to share. But what we're uh -huh. doing today is a little differently. We're looking at a story coming out of India, where economic growth is so fast that it's outpaced their electric infrastructure. So they have power outages and power cuts. So we're covering this story, and we're already coming across, you can follow this story, sorry, on our uh, website, stream.aljazeera.com. But we also have a map where we're trying to piece together the different elements of the story. So if, remember, if you're in India and you want to contribute to the story and help us report the story, please tweet us at AJStream. Georgia Popplewell, Managing Director of Global Voices, and I'm in the stream. Some call them internet heroes who fight to defend free speech and transparency online. Others dismiss them as cyber terrorists who break the law. No matter where you stand, there's no denying that the group Anonymous has become a powerful force that is redefining activism online. As you can see from my screen, I've got this particular image that is very powerful. It is a Guy Fawkes mask, and it's actually been taken from the movie V for Vendetta. Now, this is an image that has come to define Anonymous, and in a nutshell, we can't even describe them as a group per se. This are people who meet in internet relay chats, IRC rooms mm -hmm. online, and they discuss issues that are of interest to them. Now, we know that they do take part in some activities that people consider cyber activist -y. They were involved in uh, Tunisia in battling against the government's shutdown of censorship, of right. censorship there. We also know that with WikiLeaks, uh, when companies like MasterCard, Visa, PayPal refused to process transactions for WikiLeaks, uh, they actually engaged in DDoS attacks on them, mm -hmm. distributed denial of service attacks, where they basically shut down the websites of MasterCard, Visa, PayPal, and uh, some other places like Amazon. So you see that activist side, but then they also engage in activities called lulls, where they'll do things that are kind of just for fun, uh, little hacks or activities that some people would consider to be, uh, I don't even know how to put it, either prankish right. or, or some people have said it's or mischievous, right. etc. So it's not like they have this basic moral code per no. se, uh, to give us a little bit more insight into who this organization is and what they're all about. We're happy to have joining us from New York University, Assistant Professor Gabriella Coleman, who's extensively researched the group. Gabriella, thank you so much. Welcome to the stream. Thank you. So, uh, Gabriella, could you define for us, uh, in simple terms, what is Anonymous? I have to say you did a, a wonderful job describing the sort of arc of activity they're involved in. Thank you. And one of the defining characteristics is that they're hard to define at some level. 
But prior to 2008, it was a name that was used precisely to coordinate uh, pranks and hacks and it grew out of an image board called 4chan. And then in 2008, it also grew some sort of political arms or wings, um, which have sort of multiplied since then as well. And so currently you have different people who use the name to, to coordinate political activities that range from protesting the Church of Scientology to supporting WikiLeaks, but the name is still used to also engage in prankish activity as well. Now I'm curious, how did this particular um experience come together? Because it's not a group with a, a leader per se. It's not got an organizational structure. What is the genesis of it? Well, the genesis in some ways came from this image board where everyone posts anonymously and there was sort of a, a commitment to the ethic of anonymity, uh, an ethic that's also anti-celebrity, uh, anti-individualism. But in some ways, uh, when they pranked the Church of Scientology in 2008, they went on internet relay chat and started to sort of coordinate political action. And in some ways, that is when the sort of political sensibility was born. And there's a little bit more organization in the political wings uh, when it comes to the sort of technical resources. And yet there's a lot of flexibi flexibility and dynamism built into Anonymous when it comes to who and what they're going to engage with politically. Nora, this is really fascinating because on the one hand, you see sites, traditional social media, places like Facebook, that are actually curtailing people's activities based upon whether or not the organization decides it sees it as legitimate. Right. Uh, and then you have something like Anonymous where people are literally pursuing freedom and doing what they do. You are the founder of an open source collective of your own. Yeah. How do the principles of open source play when you look at something like Anonymous vis-a-vis -vis how the rest of the world is engaged in social media? Yeah, I mean, I, I would like to draw also um, parallels to the revolutions that are going on. Mm -hmm. And what I really like about this is this rhizomic uh, approach where it's non-hierarchical. Mm -hmm. And it's it's a beautiful, almost like egalitarian approach to a topic. This sounds all very complicated. But what I mean is that um, it's, it's bottom up, you know, people are unhappy about something, they want to change something, and they push consensus to find what kind of action they want to take. Mm -hmm. And so I, I, I've, I've, what I read about Anonymous, this is how it works, and you can correct me, um, and this is what works on Berta style, people create something together, but this is the same in the revolutions, you know, people are unhappy, they organize themselves, and then they take action. So it's a great way of for civil society and for democracy, actually. So, well, this is the, the thing that's interesting to me when you think about the organizing and taking action. And, and Gabrielle, I, I would love to get your insights on this because, again, Facebook is a place where everyone saw, oh, they had a significant role to play in, let's say, the Egypt or Tunisian revolutions. Uh, Anonymous also had a significant role to play, but they're very, very different fl platforms. Can you talk to us a little bit about the relative efficacy of an organization that has no idea of identity vis-a-vis -vis places where, you know, maybe the regime can actually find your identity? Right. No, it's very interesting because um, they are organized quite distinctly in some ways, and yet they have a sort of shared repertoire of, of tactics uh, and history that they draw on in order to engage in actions. And this uh, Includes things like denial of service attacks, uh, which they engaged in throughout the Middle East against government websites. But it also uh, includes helping activists on the ground uh, so that they can protect themselves from surveillance. It also includes the production of videos and, and manifestos that get circulated. And, and this is a sort of a consciousness raising aspect to, to the sort of work they do. You know, now, on that point, I'm sorry, Gabriela, Ahmed was showing me a really cool video on Tunisia, on the operation in Tunisia. And, you know, Anonymous got involved in uh, the Tunisian uprising right. long before mainstream media did. This is a video that we put together that gives yeah. a brief explanation. Very, very, very quickly, back when we were just, you know, coming up with the concept for this actual sh show, for the stream, we were following the Tunisian uprising and the role that Anonymous played, we'd just like to highlight very quickly. Tunisia's government began hacking into and deleting Facebook accounts. Protesters called for help from hacktivist groups. An unprecedented crackdown on social media censorship should get in touch with hacktivists and We really need a local hashtag version of Anonymous in the Arab world. And soon enough, another hashtag appeared across the network. Anonymous. The Tunisian government has decided it wants to restrict the freedoms of their own people. In doing so, the Tunisian government has made itself an enemy of Anonymous. Within a matter of hours, Anonymous launched Operation Tunisia. 
paralyzing the president's site, several key ministries, and the stock exchange. The group also shared a cyber war survival guide, sharing cables from WikiLeaks documenting Ben Ali's corruption, tips on running from cops, and proxy sites to access Facebook and Twitter. The government quickly countered... So we're going to stop that right there and just uh, highlight a quick question that came in, actually, um, from someone. Uh, this is someone called, uh, essentially, sorry, A.H. A. H. Fitzpatrick is asking, Anonymous is overrated, criminal, self-righteous, and det detrimental to the freedom of the Internet. What do you say to that? So it's interesting. I think he's, um, or he or she, is especially referring to the denial of service attacks which is a very, very controversial tactic, and quite understandably as well, because it has been used to, to silence small human rights organizations all over the world. Um, and yet other people also argue that when so much of our life happens online, we have to have uh, tactics, uh, dissent tactics, protest tactics, Yes, that we can do online and the DDoS. I mean, just because just because something somebody says it's illegal, mm -hmm. it doesn't mean it's not right. You know, I mean, who mm -hmm. defines what is illegal or not? Usually, it's the person in power. This is a fascinating saying, point you know, because so they, women rights or yeah. any kind of civil rights, they were going and people not being allowed to drive the same mm -hmm. buses back right. in the U.S. Well, this like, is something that we're seeing a yeah. lot. Is this idea? You know, historically, it's the state that determines what is legitimate, what is legal, what's not. Right. Yeah. But when you have states that are seen as illegal legitimate by the people, how do you then say to the people, yeah. you're rising up or you're acting yeah. against And it seems I, like that I, a lot of times people, yeah, that there, a lot of use, or users don't have rights on the internet. Yeah. You know, I mean, like certain things, and I was I was reading this um, a piece by Richard Stallman talking about e-books, how you can't just um, distribute them the way you want. You buy a physical book, I can yeah. give it to you. Yeah, but I can't do that with my e-book, you, you know? know? On that Same point, with I money. Continue... If I want to pass money around, you oh, know, I've... It's Have much different when you're right. doing it yes. online. Uh, so to that point, I want to continue with this mm -hmm. aspect of the conversation, but I want to thank you first, Gabriella, for joining us. We really appreciate you uh, offering some more information on the nature of Anonymous. My pleasure. Now, we're going to continue uh, this conversation, but before we do, we want you to know that if you are interested in tweeting your stories to us, if you want to influence the kind of stories we cover, definitely tweet us directly at AJ Stream. Next, we're going to be getting an insider's look at how Anonymous works and what measures some are trying to take to stop them. Hi, I'm Zita. I'm a Belgian grad student at Georgetown University, and I'm in Stream. Cyber conflict. It's not a Hollywood fantasy anymore. A recent clash between U.S. government contractor H.B. Gary Federal and Anonymous has underlined how much it has become a part of our lives. This story was really quite fascinating. In a nutshell, an American security firm, H.B. Gary Federal, uh, basically had their uh, a senior executive claim that he had infiltrated Anonymous. And he said that he had gotten access to people's names and private information. And once Anonymous heard about this, they actually responded. Uh, the CEO of HB Gary, Aaron Barr, precipitated this, and Anonymous went in, hacked their servers, found email addresses, all kinds of private information, leaked that information publicly. Now there is a federal investigation. Mm -hmm. The CEO was fired. He, had to, he lost his job. And there's a federal investigation into some of the activities of HB Gary, which basically was the organization saying, look, don't mess with us. So there you see a kind of a conflict happening in the digital world. We want to know a little bit more about these security issues. So we have joining us via Skype from Durban, South Africa, internet security consultant Haroon Mir. He's the founder of Thinkst, a company that focuses on information technology safety. Also with us is an Anon. And, but we use the term Anon, right. Anon for someone who's a participant in Anonymous. And that's why we have his uh, identity protected for security reasons. And I just want to throw in there quickly that we also are chatting with a group of members of Anonymous on an IRC chat and we're throwing questions to them. Absolutely. So uh, first, let's actually start with an Anon. I understand that you are a, a participant in Op Tunisia. Can you tell us a little bit about that? Anon, can you hear us? Okay, we're going to try to get him back in, in, a, in a moment, but Haroon, let's uh, come to you first. We were just bringing up the issue of HB Gary Federal. You see here Anonymous taking down or at least creating some significant problems for an American corporation. You know, what are the implications when a distributed group of individuals can have that kind of influence over a corporation? 
Yeah, I think it's interesting times uh, for all of us. I think uh, one of the things that the HP Gary attack or internet attack show you is the asymmetry problem. Yeah. Um, techno we like technology because it acts almost as a force multiplier. So a small company can take on a, a large one. And effectively, with better technology, they're able to take on larger companies. And when it turns to internet attacks, you kind of see the same result where a small group of people with technology behind them can, can have huge impact. And what kinds of things are people doing to protect themselves from these attacks? I mean, when we see companies like MasterCard, Visa, big companies being affected, is there any way to protect yourself? Oh, I, I think there's, there's a fair bit that can be done to try to protect yourself. Um, and I think to a large extent, uh, like PayPal, for example, weren't completely taken out during the attacks. But I think one of the facts of life that uh, Internet security people have been preaching for a long time is that we are a lot more vulnerable than we know. The Internet was built for a friendlier time. You know what and I think when it comes to protection? I think it's not just a question of technology. It's a mm -hmm. question of your actions. Mm -hmm. Like, are you doing the right thing? Yeah. Right? But, but I think that a lot of people <laughs> have believed that they could act with impunity right. because if you are strong, if you are a, a corporation, if you have access to Absolutely. money and power, if you are a state, then who is going to say or do anything yeah. against you? And that's why what Anonymous has done in the context of the Arab revolutions right. has been really fascinating because they've basically seen people who are standing up for themselves yeah. in the real world and they have done their been digital participants yeah, and, in that. Yeah, and when you go back to the uh, Operation Payback, right? Yeah. I mean, they've done that because they felt that, or they've done the... Uh, they, they done You're talking the, about the response to WikiLeaks. Yeah, exactly. Yes. So they've done that because they felt PayPal and MasterCard didn't wait for... They didn't follow it in dubio pro reo, right? They, yeah. they just yeah. said, okay, WikiLeaks is guilty. Yeah. We're going to stop... Yeah, it wasn't innocent right. exactly. until proven guilty. Yeah. Right. Well, exactly. you know, even with the Arab, you know, we talked about, we showed in that video that they really took a stance and they did something practical. So they shared these WikiLeaks cables, but they also shared other documents to try and really, um, you know, and they're inserting themselves into a political situation mm -hmm. and, and they're not, they have no problems doing that. Now, when we put that question to some of the people in the IRC chat, some of the members from Anonymous, mm -hmm. one, one response we got, I don't know if you could see it right here on my screen, is uh, I'd answer that we're not simply acting on our personal preferences. We might bend and break certain laws, but it doesn't happen just because, oh, let's do that. It's mm -hmm. done if enough people agree on certain stuff. So they're so, crowdsourcing. Well, and, and this is interesting because part of what's happening is we're redefining models of democracy. Yeah. I mean, to bring it back into the political arena, a lot of times people say, okay, if you have a democracy, everyone gets a vote, right. then now that's freedom. Right. But not necessarily. If you look even at the United States example, mm -hmm. you know, private... Uh, money is a big influencer in who gets to be elected, who gets right. to have television ads, who gets an opportunity to even be considered in a quote-unquote democratic process. Yeah. So what's happening is people are finding ways to create their own models of what they believe is right. the will of the people. Well, we have power to all who's really you know, directly correlating Anonymous's mission and d the democratic mission. He's saying Anonymous stands for free speech. DDoS is being used as a tool. It only blocks people from going to a yeah, site. Yeah, it's like a strike. doesn't break it. It's, yes. like, it's like sitting in front, sit -in. front of a building yeah. and saying you can't go in here because what the people are doing is wrong. Right. So. so is technology then shifting the way this whole generation, our generation, mm -hmm. thinks about our ability to act in society because I would argue that you know a hundred years ago let's say you wanted to have a revolution and you were gonna sit in somewhere and protest it and there wasn't the ability of the whole world to watch right they would just come in and kill all of you right. and then what right yeah. right but but it's a whole different world yeah I mean now it can happen in a, not a safe space I'm not gonna use the word safe but you know in the cyber world so it's essentially a mm -hmm. cyber war a cyber form of dissent so I want to go back to Skype right now and see if we have Anon with us again Anon are you there I am Okay, talk to us a little bit. First of all, we really appreciate you spending uh, some time to give us some insight into you, what you do. Talk to us a little bit about your participation in Op Tunisia. Well, Op Tunisia um, actually began at the end of another operation, which uh, I think you've already spoken about on the program, which was the operation to um, effectively to try and um, draw some attention to the companies who had... Um, dropped their services to WikiLeaks yes. in late December. Um, during this operation, we obviously had a, a chat where people would post articles about companies and governments that had attempted to censor WikiLeaks. And one of the things that came up was that um, WikiLeaks had published some documents relating to the 
uh, to corruption in the Tunisian government. And so, therefore, the Tunisian government had completely blocked all access to WikiLeaks from inside Tunisia on the Internet. And um, a lot of people in, uh, in, the, in Operation WikiLeaks at the time said that that was unacceptable. So they be, that, that was how Tunisia started out. That's, re- that's very interesting because it started out as an extension of something, not necessarily to make a political statement. Anand, I would ask you, uh, do you consider yourself you know, a political operative, you personally, not necessarily anonymous as a whole, and how does anonymous deal with the questions of when to get involved in dealing with political movements? I would definitely consider myself a very political person. Um, as I've said before, nobody can speak for the whole of Anonymous because mm-hmm. there is no whole of Anonymous. It's, it's more like a franchise name than a defined group. Mm-hmm. So it's, I don't think anybody can put a label on the movement as a whole. But what I would say is that um, in general, when we have been after Op Tunisia, obviously, um, Anonymous sort of branched out into all of the different Arab Spring operations, as they're called. And... Um, Basically, the rule that we had was a lot of people would post articles about oppression in in various different countries. And I think the the, the rule that people came up with was if – and remember, of course, there's no leader, so this is all decided by consensus, by mass consensus. The rule that was uh, decided on was that we wouldn't begin an operation unless something had already started on the ground. Mm -hmm. In other words, we wouldn't attempt to start a revolution on the Internet. We would merely step in and assist a revolution that was already happening. So I want to get Haroon's input on that and then. Haroon, so when we're thinking about this idea of security, basically what they're saying is that they are trying to augment the will of the people. How are states responding to this? Well, I think uh, early on we already saw some of the Arab states stepping into the cyber world, uh, trying to do the end run around uh, user privacy and uh, cutting off user access or stepping into user access. So I think the actions that you're seeing from Anon at at this end certainly are just to help those people uh, help those people find a voice. Mm-hmm. So that that's a, a really interesting point, and I want to capture and continue the conversation on that front, helping people to find the voice. This unfortunately is the end of our broadcast. I want to thank Harun Anon Noor for joining us. We're going to continue this conversation online. Join us at stream.aljazeera.com. Tweet us at AJStream. We will see you now online. Thanks for joining us once again. You are in the stream. We are now in the post show. This is right here on our website and where we get a chance to get deeper into some of the issues that we've already been discussing. Uh, We have joining us right now Haroon from uh, Durban and also Anon. And before I come back to you, I want to get, Nora, your idea of this uh, concept or your thoughts on this concept of people helping each other, literally. I mean, Anon is telling us that Anonymous doesn't get involved. They're not going to start a revolution. They're going to participate if this is what people really want. Is this showing us a new phase of the empowerment of individuals as well as groups? Um, Yeah, I think so. And I actually, I wonder what the future plans are, if there are any, Mm. talking about the Spanish Revolution that we talked about yesterday. And I was just wondering, I'm very curious if if I could ask Anon, you know, is there something that... Or when do you determine, or are you talking about the Spanish Revolution already? Well, um, can I answer now? Yes, please do. Okay. Um, yeah, sorry, there's a bit of a delay on my Skype, so I'm never sure when to talk. Um, basically, what I would say is that these discussions all happen on our IRC network, which is open to anybody to come in and watch. And there are um, various different channels. There are like different rooms, different chat rooms on the IRC. And... Um, Effectively, somebody will propose uh, an idea, and if enough people like that idea, then they'll run with it and they'll create their own um, operation for it. That's how operations have generally happened Mm -hmm. so far. But if you're asking me about the future plans of Anonymous, nobody can really answer that question because nobody knows even 
who will be in Anonymous tomorrow. It just depends who's online at the time. Anand, this is a great point. And Ahmed has got some comments. He's been participating yeah. in the chat. Yeah, so whether the conversation's happening, you know, online on the internet or in this IRC chat, we're coming to the same conclusions. Uh, I threw the same question to this uh, IRC chat with some of the Anonymous members, and they're saying, Anonymous has no leadership, so they can't really answer this question. And whatever comes to Anonymous's attention is essentially, you know, has a you know it's very quick and so they're saying everyone's invited to kind of have these discuss and discuss and discussions. Yeah, and there's an interesting one at the bottom that says, uh, it, no, it's not like there are plans. We're yeah, we're do not going to do this and that in three months. Yeah. Right. It often just happens out of a certain. But momentum. I wonder how this structure of anonymous can be applied to any kind of democratic society or any kind of society. Like how can you? How can you form a right. network? Like a wide, you mean like a wider, yeah. right? Well, I mean, I think one interesting example is let's say open source software. You know, you have a bunch of people working towards a particular end, right. and they can choose what kind. And there are all kinds of different uh, collectives that are involved in uh, coding collectively. Mm -hmm. But I think that there's an interesting dynamic that happens when you remove identity from it, right? Mm -hmm. Because once you see, as long as people have access to your identity, and Haroon, I want to get your thoughts on this as well. I feel like once people have access to your identity, you give yourself a certain kind of vulnerability. There's right. the opportunity for kudos, right. and there's also the opportunity for reprisal. Right. So I think that the kind of action you are willing to take and the way you do it together changes when you are literally anonymous. What's your take on that, Haroon? Yeah, absolutely. And and there's normally a really big call for, for people to try to mitigate the amount of anonymity that people right. have online for exactly this reason, because uh, people, when they're anonymous, can be bad and pedophiles and all bad stuff happens. But one of the things we need to understand is that anonymity needs company. You can't be anonymous alone. And, and so in some way, lots of the stuff that needs to happen needs the cover of an anonymity and in a way, we need to promote it because of the good in it, even though there is some bad in it. Now, I want to take a question to Anon. Uh, and if this is something that's actually coming from our control room. And they want to know, what happened to your mask? <laughs> yeah, I knew that one was going to come up. Um, well, <laughs> effectively, it's, um, it's, I know I was going to appear wearing a Guy Fawkes mask like we usually do. Mm -hmm. And um, effectively, it's been a couple of weeks since I've done an interview. Are I you telling me your Guy Fawkes I'm, mask is at the laundry? <laughs> uh, it's somewhere. It is somewhere in my house. I spent about half an hour looking for it before this interview began, <laughs> and I couldn't find it. <laughs> so, um, I, I'm afraid that's why I'm only appearing on audio. Um, I realize that that well, sounds incredibly stupid, and it is incredibly stupid. Well, it's it's not a problem because your question mark is very is very fitting. Um, yeah. You know, I think that uh, Ahmed has also got a really interesting. Uh, yeah image that came up with regards to the Spanish Revolution that we were yeah, talking about the Nora, other day. Nora spoke earlier about the Span. you know, how could this be interpreted or used in the Spanish Revolution or if there are any plans. And, you know, I just noticed one of the tweets that came in yesterday when we were talking about the, the, revo the uprising across Spain was that a lot of these masks are being used by these protesters. Yeah. So it seems like there's a coalition of sorts, you know, a mm -hmm. broader coalition of people trying to fight for uh, freedoms and you know for uh, for uh, access to information and, and similar things that you're fighting with. So and also for our viewers who don't know what we're talking about with regard to Spain, basically it's this whole idea that people are having these campings. They're basically camping all around the country to protest the right. high unemployment rate, 20% unemployment, highest in this eurozone. Mm -hmm. um, I, I get the sense that a lot of people are feeling in the wake of what's happened in Tunisia, then in yeah, Egypt, and across the North Africa and Middle East. They're inspired. Is that they're inspired. They feel like they can have a little bit more uh, uh, agency in their lives and in pursuing their lives. And I want to take this question back to Anand. I mean, do you personally feel any sense of responsibility or pride in spreading this I these ideas of people power or, or personal empowerment? Well, as is the um, the sort of one of the fundamental aspects of Anonymous, I, I try not to let my own personal ego come into it, but mm -hmm. um, I do feel a lot of pride towards the, the movement itself. I think um, that we've, I think we've started something here which, which isn't going to go away. Um, Somebody was talking earlier on about, you know, um, anonymity and and how it can help. I think one of the one of the things which wasn't mentioned, which I think is very interesting, is that it means that when people are, you know, gain any respect or otherwise on the IRC, it it is never anything to do with their 
you know, their nationality or their gender or mm. their age or anything like that. It is purely based on if you have good ideas, if yeah. you make good suggestions. It, it's purely based on your own intellect. That's the only thing that people will judge you by. I wish mm. the world so, would function like that. It'd be yeah. a beautiful place, yeah. Yeah, right? <laughs> but, but maybe this is part of helping the world yeah. to function like Because think about it. I mean, when else have you had a position where people could take a stand like that and the world could start to realize that that's happening. Yeah, yeah, it's a very inspirational philosophy that goes across borders, race, anything. Uh, yeah. Anon, I just want to you know, highlight one article that we have on our website um, called Anonymous and the Arab Uprisings. And the reason I'm doing so, you know, you can, you, we're inviting our viewers to read it and comment on it because it's really interesting. One thing that is referenced is a quote from Gabriella Coleman, who's an anthropologist at NYU in New York. She says, if you didn't have IRC, you wouldn't have anonymous. Now, is that true? Is that that fair, direct correlation? Um, I would say that the thing about IRC is, you see, that um, IRC is completely and utterly anonymous. You don't have to have an account if you don't want one. You don't have to supply an email address in order to get an account even. Right. Um, all you have to do is have a program, or, or if you don't have a program, there are various online websites that will connect you to IRC. Mibit is one, for instance, that anybody can use. Mm -hmm. And... Um, it basically means, though, that the whole point about IRC is that it, it is completely anonymous. Unless somebody has access to the actual IRC server, they can't. There's absolutely no way to trace where somebody is. So that's where the community really lives, the anonymous community. That's where everything is planned, if anything is planned. Well, there are various image boards and other websites out there where things are planned as well. But the the other thing about IRC, it isn't just the the anonymity. Sorry. The other thing is, of course, that it's in real time. You type something and it immediately appears to everybody who's talking, mm -hmm. very like Skype or Facebook chat or anything like that. Mm -hmm. So it's much easier, obviously, to plan something in real time than to make a post on a message board and then for somebody else to read it an hour later. You know, um, I, I want to I broaden this conversation a little bit, actually. <laughs> and, and there are a couple of things. One, I'm hearing from the control room that Anonymous has flooded uh, Twitter with like 65,000 tweets about AJ Stream. So that is... Well, that's great of, news for yeah, us. That, that works for us. But uh, and so we appreciate that. But I, I want to take it back to this broader issue that we were discussing about, you know, Obama's speech on the Middle East. Right. And the thing that is interesting to me in the context of both of these conversations mm -hmm. is just literally thinking about these actions that were taken by young people in the streets right. of Tunis, right. Of, of Sidi Bouzid, of Cairo, of, of all, you know, all these different places around the world, mm -hmm. uh, have, and the actions that were taken digitally as well, have actually forced, they precipitated at right. least a shift in policy from mm -hmm. the United States. Right. I mean, the President of the United States is a dude with a fair amount of clout. He may not normally be looking at what are kids thinking on the streets of Cairo, but something seems to be shifting. Haroon, I want to get your thoughts on this more broadly. Mm -hmm. Are we entering a phase where citizens, individuals, youth, women, the people who have historically not been as powerful are actually becoming more empowered? Uh, it's a little bit out of my area of expertise, but <laughs> I think one of the things that uh, that's clear is that the cyber world is uh, a major frontier for all of this. And all of the established power bases know this. I mean, all of the major superpowers are now establishing a presence in, in cyberspace for exactly this reason, U.S. Cybercom. And yeah, it's it's a lot of power, and it's a lot of power that's really decentralized. Mm -hmm. And so that power may be shifting back to the people. On, on the note of it being decentralized, we want to share a tweet that came in from Mind Detonator, who who is saying, even though Anonymous has flexed its muscles and shown its strength, he's saying Anonymous is anarchism. It has no ideology, no centralization, and opposes authority if there is solidarity. It's democracy 2.0. Anon, what do you say to that? I, I think that's absolutely correct. Um, I think that is exactly what Anonymous more or less stands for. I mean, you will see um, in, in Anonymous there are channel, and this is a mistake that's often made, actually. People accuse us of, of lying about the leadership thing because there are obviously IRC moderators and chat moderators on, on our servers. But if you actually spend some time on the IRC and look into it, you'll find that all, of, all they do is make sure that the IRC keeps functioning smoothly. Um, mm. For instance, they stop people from flooding it with, with bot attacks and various things like that. And if one of the servers goes down, they'll work on getting it back up. So it's, it's very much like, um, if I could give you an analogy, if you think about the Speaker of the House of Parliament, mm -hmm. 
he doesn't actually make the laws. He just makes sure that, you know, everybody is given a chance to speak and that there's an environment where things can be done. You know, Anan, I want to thank you for joining us. Haroon, I want to thank you as well. Noor, we're going to finish with one last quote. In the 21st century, information is power. The truth cannot be hidden. And the legitimacy of governments will ultimately depend on active and informed citizens. That's a quote that uh, has just been pulled up by Barack Obama. We will see you again tomorrow.